in the 21st century Hard-working people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Chip Nellinger. Chip is with Blue Reef Agri-Marketing in Morton, Illinois. And this edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Dawson Tire and Wheel, your premier ag tire and wheel provider in North America, helping people grow. Tractor Zoom delivering insights. And Dry Shot Boots, the official work boot of the Moving Iron Podcast. Chip, how you been, man? Hey, uh, doing well, Casey. It's been a little while here. I got uh, got laid low with uh, a little bit of a bug and... Uh, it wasn't COVID though. I went and got tested. It was more of a stomach thing, and it's it's been busy. So uh, we haven't talked for a couple, um, probably almost three weeks. Yeah, it's been a little while. It's been a little bit. Well, there's in our little hiatus there. There was uh, no lack of things to talk about, and today there's definitely no lack of things to talk about. So the Fed came out with their big uh, their big meeting, came back with a, with, a, with a new monetary agenda, and it really is the same song, different dance type of deal. Um, they're going to keep interest rates at zero, and they're pretty much painting a picture of this could be the the worst economy that we've seen in some while. Um, and I think how they put it was in our lifetime, which I thought that was the the housing crisis of 2008. But maybe this is going to be worse than that, I guess. I don't know for sure what they were getting at there when they said that. But nonetheless, um, because of that, the dollar kind of kind of puked a little bit today, and that's that abs- you know it's going to help with some exports. So I guess as you look around. The overall health of the uh, the market right now, Chip. What are you seeing out there, and what are some of the directions you're you're heading towards? Yeah, well, there's a lot of moving gears out there, Casey. Yes, there's there is. there's uh, that's part of the problem trying to figure this thing out from the Fed perspective. Um, I don't think they really shocked the market. Uh, I think the market was expecting that. They basically said, you know, we're going to keep throwing the kitchen sink at this thing. Everything uh, we can do, we will do. Um, you know, they've been doing some really out of the box things as far as buying uh, different tranches of bonds and securities, and uh, they are supporting this thing. Uh, the dollar has dropped. <clears throat> That's taken on a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, you know publicity here recently. Uh, but the the dollar here, here's the the good and the bad, right? The, the dollar index is what most people look at when when they talk about the dollar. And, and the dollar index is a basket of, I don't know how many different uh, currencies are in there, but they're weighted differently. And, and one of the problems is the euro currency um, has a weighting of almost 50%. So it's overweighted. And the, and the euro currency... Uh, because of some financial stuff going on and Brexit and, and some of the stuff going on in Europe, the euro currency has had a huge rally. And so that's half of the weighting of the dollar index. And and then some of the like the British pound, the Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, those have followed along as well. The problem is, so so that's a good thing, right? I mean, I guess from a from a big picture perspective, if you're an exporter of goods out of the United States, you want the dollar to weaken up. And, that, and President Trump has been on record adamantly wanting a weaker dollar. The problem comes in the standpoint from our, our competitive commodity countries. So for example, Russia, huge exporter of wheat uh, and, and corn to a lesser extent. Uh, Brazil, obviously, they're a huge exporter of, of everything, beans and corn both. Uh, Argentina, uh, their currency versus the U.S. dollar hasn't really gone up a lot relative to the dollar. Um, in fact, the last couple of days here, the Brazilian currency has, has gone down relative to the dollar. And so you look on the one hand, you see the, the dollar index uh, at multi-month lows and, you know, un- closing under a major trend line today. But, um, you know, you look at the big picture here and um, it may not, we may not be getting the bang for the buck 
because our major competitors, particularly Russia, on the wheat perspective and um, and the southern hemisphere, they're not seeing you know that appreciation of their currency uh, relative to the dollar. So uh, a little good and the bad with with the dollar thing. The Fed thing, I don't think mattered a whole lot. What matters to the grains right now is the weather. <clears throat> and there are several areas. If you're sitting there, maybe in parts of Nebraska, you know, out, out by you, um, which, by the way, the market discounts Nebraska because the bulk of the major corn producing areas of Nebraska have massive amounts of irrigation. So when it comes to hot, dry weather, the market somewhat discounts Nebraska because of the irrigation issue. Certainly, the if you divide Iowa into quarters, the southwest quarter of Iowa is is really hot, really dry, and that extends even probably into you know right in the dead center of, of Iowa. Um, super hot, super dry. Problem is, everywhere else has gotten pretty good rains here uh, in the month of July. And now the extended forecast is going to cool down. We've got much cooler temperatures coming. Like we were here in central Illinois, we're 90 degrees today. We were up in the mid-90s on the weekend. But going forward, the next 10 days, you know, we have high temperatures. The highest highs are like 82 degrees. And, and then there's a few days where we're up in the upper 70s. And it's a little bit on the dry side. But now we now you have the extended like 8 to 14-day forecast starting to hint at some rain out there. And so the market's taking this in. They're looking at the crop condition report we saw Monday. It showed 3% improvements on good to excellent of both corn and beans. Massive jump in Illinois corn, 11% higher. Um, I have to look back. If that wasn't the biggest one-week jump in history, it was very clear. It was in the top three, certainly. A massive increase in crop conditions uh, in certain states, particularly Illinois. And so the market's looking at that saying, you know, what's bullish right now? You know, we're coming in. We got a lot of old crop corn left. There's some of that being spit out here down on the lows, unfortunately. Um, If we do get some rain here in the coming two weeks, cooler temperatures, you know, this thing could be shaping up for a perfect finish. If that happens, that's a big if because those extended forecasts, you know, they'll change six times between now and, right. and two weeks from now. But right. uh, yeah. as you break it down, there's just nothing out there right now that's super bullish. China's been quiet here. They were a massive buyer in the last, um, you know, other than the last two days, they were buyers 10 straight days of U.S. beans. And they've kind of quieted down. And uh, so there's just nothing on the radar right now that's bullish enough to break us out of this trend in corn beans have been hit a little bit the last couple of days and so it's all about the weather but that can change too so i mean we, we got to take that with a grain of salt but right now um the the calendar's against us as far as you know it's just hard to get a rally generated going into august unless you have some massive deterioration of the of the forecast a lot hot hotter drier temperatures coming so that's what's really kind of hitting the corner of the bean market it's like pushing a uh, a boulder up a mountain in the mud it's just really hard this time frame to get a rally generated and and uh, so the path of least resistance is lower and we've certainly seen that so far this week yep so i want to go back and talk about um the uh, dollar for a second so to kind of reiterate your point that you made there about some of our competition out there and, and their uh, their currency's not falling along with it. Wow! You typically, when the U.S. dollar contracts, somebody else's currency is 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 gaining some strength, right? It's, that's a typical kind of ebb and flow there. What we're seeing with this COVID nineteen uh, economy is across the country, across the whole world is I've read reports anywhere from seventy to ninety percent of the world's Economies are all in some level of contraction, some worse than others, obviously. But so that kind of goes back to the point you made there is, you know, the dollar is is losing value or contracting or whatever you want to call it. And so is everybody else's, too. So 
you really don't get a leg up anywhere, anywhere when it comes to the export. Is that is that kind of what you're seeing out there a little bit to that effect? Yes. <clears throat> yes, to, to a certain extent, yes. And, and, and the currencies that we are dropping against, like, for example, the, the, the euro currency, well, yeah. they're a big trading partner of us, but we don't, we don't export a lot of grain to right. the European Union. Uh, you know, the British pound has appreciated against the dollar. Again, we don't do much for them. The Australian dollar has rallied. I guess you could argue that maybe competitively we're getting a little bit of a bump there uh, competitively on the on the wheat because um, Australia is a big a big wheat producer. But our our biggest competitors, Russia uh, and and Brazil, their currency continues to to weaken relative to the U.S. dollar. So there, we're not gaining a competitive advantage on our two biggest. Uh, you know, competitors on the world market as far as grain exports go, and, and that's namely Brazil and Russia. And uh, so the, the drop in the dollar is is the dollar index, right? Well, unfortunately, the dollar index doesn't, the basket um, doesn't include the Russian ruble or the Brazilian real. And so that's muting. Now it's great from a perspective, you know, you look at... Uh, you look at crude oil prices, okay? We export a lot of crude oil to, right. to some of those countries. Uh, crude oil is holding, you know, north of 40. Uh, gold went to a new all-time high this week. Silver's had a massive rally. Um, you know, some other commodities are seeing great benefit from that. But unfortunately, it's not correlating over to our grain markets necessarily, particularly corn and, and beans. Maybe it's you can argue it's helping the wheat a little bit, but um, you know, unfortunately, there's not a massive shortage of wheat anywhere in the world right now. So that's always a highly competitive market, and we're not we're not gaining much of that uh, business yet in in the wheat. So I guess if anything, you could argue maybe it's the drop in the dollars probably helping support the wheat a little bit, but certainly not the corn and the beans, particularly because. Of Brazil and also to a lesser extent, um, you know, Russia on the on the corn side. Yeah. So you talked about China here, and kind of in your in your uh, in your opening statements there, and they you know kind of kind of put it along here a little bit, and all of a sudden here of late, their their purchases from the U.S. have taken off. You know, amidst all the problems they're having with the trade talks, which have, are non existence anymore. I mean, I think they talked more and in January of 2018 and they're talking now, but th- I guess that's pretty much a key indicator that China needs stuff and we're kind of the only uh, shop on the block to get it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, it is. <clears throat> we are supposed to have sometime here very soon, either la- within the next couple of weeks, I think, kind of a review with China, uh, government to government on how this uh, phase one is going, how whether they're meeting the in the numbers needed. And so you can argue that the the large amount that they've been buying, you know, they bought a little over 3 million metric tons of, of U.S. corn, their biggest yeah. purchases of U.S. corn for 20-plus uh, years, massive amounts of beans. Uh, they bought some wheat. Uh, the, you know, they bought a lot of pork uh, and probably some other minor um you know, non-exchange traded type agricultural products. Um, being pessimistic, you can argue like, okay, they're just they're just getting to where they need to be um, as far you know to kind of keep the heat off them, so to speak, and to, to, for this review. Now, a lot of that's been you know the scary part is a lot of those beans have been from a new crop position, so they got plenty of time if things go wrong. Um switch those sales to the southern hemisphere or just outright cancel them and uh, but it's good to see that the the sales are on the books i mean and it's a big amount but um unless they keep going at the pace they've been on you know the thing to keep in mind here is that on beans the usda has our total demand about 400 million bushels higher than a year ago and so it's good to see this business from China, but 
some we need to see some of that because the bars raised so high on our total demand relative to a year ago that you know they got to keep that going. Um, our crush pace has been decent, um, you know, and and the exports have been good, but <clears throat> the bar is so high that it needs to continue. So. That's part of the, the problem in here is we, we needed to see these and we need them to continue. The question is, will they continue um, on into new crop? And then certainly, you know, at a certain point in time, once you get past about November, December, typically uh, China starts switching their buying down to Brazil okay. for their new crop beans, which are coming into harvest then and are cheaper than ours. So. You know, our, we, we still have a window here to gather some demand from China, but uh, it just seems like for the better part of two years, and you can argue maybe it's closer to the better part of two decades, that they've just been, you know, kind of playing us like a finely tuned fiddle. So that's that's always going to be there. You know, for that's the bad part about China uh, is... For 18 months, it was this trade war and tariffs and is there going to be a trade deal? You know, it was just like every day the market hung on every tweet. There's a trade deal. There's not a trade deal. It's it's good. The, there's going to be a meeting next week and two weeks and no meeting. And it, it was just, it, it was it made you just weary. Yeah. And now that there's this phase one trade deal, now it's the, it's the other side of that. It's like, okay, they bought, you know, for 10 days in a row. But not for two days. Are they going to buy tomorrow? Are they, you know, are they going to go two weeks? But now we're into the next thing: is are they buying? Are they not buying? When will they buy? If they're not buying, uh, and it's just like excruciating, you know. And they know they're the most astute cash and even futures traders in the world, and lo- massive players, and they know what they're doing, and. Um, you know, if they think there's a big crop coming, they're they're not. You know, they're going to wait for cheaper prices at a certain point. They've had a massive amount of buying here recently, so you can make an argument that they're just going to kind of maybe lay back on their heels and wait for typical harvest lows uh, that are ahead of us before they buy more. And uh, each day that goes by without fresh Chinese purchases. Is just that's more of a, a feather in the the people that want to sell this market. Yep. So let's talk about ethanol for a second here. Uh, one thing that the Chinese have been buying is, is ethanol. There's been some, um, not a bunch, they, but they they did have a week we last week the week before last they did buy a rather large amount of ethanol and and corn kind of all in the same week. So that's kind of a double whammy when it comes to. Uh, our stocks when you start looking at that. So you you get refined ethanol from corn and they're they're buying the actual corn itself. So there's a there's a great opportunity there. I guess what's your thoughts on that? I mean is that was that a blip on the radar or was that do you think that's gonna start establishing this kind of a longer term Chinese kind of mandate to that E ten, E fifteen, twenty twenty five mandate that they have out there? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think again that remains to be seen. Uh, I think that th- that is one bright spot is our ethanol markets. Whether it's you know China, Korea, Taiwan, anywhere else in the world, I think that is one bright spot that um, we we can open our market up to ethanol. We've been doing that. You know, those trade groups, those ethanol and corn growing groups, have really been doing a good job at opening our markets up. Um, so ethanol has has come back. Our stocks have been shrinking. Um, pretty healthy drop again this week in our total ethanol stocks in, in spite of a nice bounce back in production. We had a little bit of an off week last week in the total ethanol grind, but we bounced it back this week um, and had a had a pretty decent um, pretty decent week. But um, you know, I think the thing to keep in the back of our mind is so. So one thing is, I think that China has backed off a little bit on their massive push um, for that E10 and building up their 
ethanol industry. Now, that, that doesn't mean that it's done and they just abandoned it, but I don't think it's going to be um, at the rapid pace that we um, had hoped. But, I, I, you know, that is one bright spot, Casey, is we, we've got so many inroads to make as far as uh, exporting our ethanol and uh, and have done a great job. And, and we are seeing those exports increase greatly from where they were several years ago. Uh, but we're still in this environment of COVID and you know, we've got, uh, you know, well-publicized uh, areas, Texas, um, Arizona, Florida. You've, you've got, you know, kind of some semi-lockdowns again, even here in Illinois, Chicago. It, not back to full lockdown, but, you know, kind of cutting back as far as um, the bars and restaurants again. And it just doesn't seem like we've turned the corner on that. Um, here or maybe even in the world. And so that's always going to be something that, that is hanging out there until we get a little better handle on this, this virus or slow its spread down a little bit. And um, that's always a little bit scary as far as the ethanol goes here, in my opinion. But uh, we, are, we are bouncing it back. We're not, we're not back to where we were pre-COVID, but... Um, you know, we're, we're cranking along and that's, that's a good thing in my opinion. So, uh, the, the ethanol grind has, has picked up. And as you mentioned, you know, exports are uh, something that's, that's really, uh, improved here in, in years past, but, you know, let's just hope we can kind of get, get past this. That's the hope is that China becomes a more reliable trading partner. I guess I like that word more than anything. Uh, right. You know, I've gone from, 18 months of buying nothing to two weeks of massive buying. Well, let's get a feel for what they're going to do and, and let's make sure they're reliable, consistent buyers. And I don't think anyone quite believes that yet. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll see the jury's still out on that, I guess. The little boy has cried wolf too many times into this whole thing. Um, okay, exactly. So, yeah, it's, exactly. It's, no one, I mean, every time they Every time something positive comes out about some sort of export thing, the market does not rally. It doesn't do anything. I mean, it might go up a you know a few cents here and there, but there's no real massive buying or selling based on what you see out of these uh, weekly export reports. And you think that you would see that's more right. of that. So it just shows you and what that, they're, you know. You hit the, that's a great observation, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's what really scares me about beans is, you know, through this, they've been massive buyers of yeah. beans in, in the last two weeks. And we really couldn't get a, a, a rally generated in the bean market. We didn't go down, and we rallied some days. But, yeah. you know, relative to the high three weeks ago, we couldn't even, we couldn't even challenge that with massive amounts of, of Chinese buying. So when the market doesn't, you know, vice versa, you know, either way, when the market doesn't go up on bullish news or stops going down on bearish news, you better take notice. And, and I think that's a really good observation. And that gives me, that's my biggest um, fear going forward is that the bean market has had a lot of friendly news and it's not going up. Yep. And, and that scares me <clears throat> because corn you know, you look at corn, where we're at on a corn chart versus beans, and could corn go down another 20, 30 cents? Yes. But I feel, uh, unfortunately, like the bean market, as a percentage, could have a lot further to fall um, relative to corn. And corn, for a lot of people, you're already into a crop insurance payment. So it doesn't, um, that's a different conversation beans are close enough to our spring price that they're they're a long ways away from a crop insurance payment and uh from, from a price perspective and right. so that's what scares me a little bit is i i think the bean market of, of anything in here is uh is the scariest and maybe needs the most uh monitoring for you know some sort of a risk management uh action you know, whether that's some sales or some puts or 
whatever that might be, um, I, I'm fearful that what you just said through a lot of bullish news, that there's a lot of demand and, you know, here we are close to, uh, well today making several day lows. So we're not, uh, setting the world on fire price price wise with bullish news recently. It almost feels like you have to have a, a, an incredible amount of, of exports going out and some just catastrophic crop report come out to get the market to really move in any, any real direction. And we've seen that when that's what's happened, you know, those days where we've had, um, you know, weekly or monthly reports come out and there's some, there's some bullish crop uh, condition reports or something like that that show up. You've seen some market swings there, but for the most part, it's just, it's just not very reactive to, to anything. It's like the focus is on not necessarily what we see in the export, but what we have coming as far as the 2020 crop comes, uh, is what the 2020 yeah. crop looks like. So it's just, there's no, I don't know, it's like a, it's like very tunnel vision approach to the market sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. It's just so supply driven and <clears throat> there's still time, you know, we're just sitting here the uh, 29th of July. We're a little bit late in the, in the season here, but we're going to need more rain, right? right. Y- we're going to need at least another rain or two to finish these beans out, finish corn out in the month of August. And, um, you know, will we get it or, or, or not is, is a question. I suppose if you brought, you know, if you, if this cool, these cooler temperatures, didn't materialize if they if they started adding heat back if we had a really uh dry august over you know across the whole corn belt yeah things take on a different tone then but it's just so hard that the market bets on yield and if we don't if we're not struggling with hot temperatures and we get another rain or two the market's going to start assuming record crops uh, you know maybe rightfully so but uh, they're going to start factoring in, you know, big, big yields in corn and beans with uh, cooler temperatures in August and another rain or two. And, and, and then work backwards from there, right? It's right. going to be like, how low do we take this? Where's the harvest low going to be? Okay, wh- what's demand then? Is China in our market? Um, and, and then just kind of reset things. So you could still have, and, and typically that happens, right? We're going to, at some point between now and history tells you at some point between now and the first week of October, we're going to put a harvest low in. And then a lot of years, even in big crops, even in record crop years, you have some really nice post harvest bounces. And so, um, you know, it's not like it's all lost and we're going to zero in here, but it's, it's a real uphill battle right now, the next few weeks, especially if. We get a few more rains across the corn belt. Yep. All right. So let's jump over and talk about the proteins for a minute. So I've been paying attention to this a little bit since the economy started to open back up just to see where things are. And, you know, in May, <clears throat> when you start looking at cold storage uh, reports, May was the low, obviously, and it, it fell off pretty fast from from April to May, even from, you know, from March to May it was a pretty staggering drop. From May to June, it, it kind of climbed up a little bit um, to just a, like 430 million pounds, roughly. I'm just kind of looking at the graph here, which is which is higher than it was in 2017 and 2019 as well. But it's it's a very it's not a very steep slope back up. So I guess when you look at cold storage, which is a pretty good indicator of of uh, what we see happen as far as demand goes. What's your thoughts on that? Well, from this this report, uh, for one, cold storage reports are really volatile and hard to, uh, you know, take a lot from. Um, probably of anything that jumped out on that cold storage report from last week was uh, the pork. Saw a pretty good uh, decrease in a lot of different uh, categories. And so that, that was much needed because we're, we've been struggling with a massive supply of, uh, of pork here recently. Uh, the beef side is, is a little cloudier, um, to me. And I, I, I don't know if you can read too much uh, into that yet from the, 
from the beef side. Um, seems like we're at pretty good equilibrium here. We've stabilized the uh, the box beef market. Uh, we've stabilized, although we might be a little bit lower in the, in the cash market this week. We've we've at least stabilized the cash uh, on on the on the cattle side. And so I think, and, and I, the other thing I like is that we've faced a lot of heat, you know, in, in the plains this year, Oklahoma, Kansas, that area have been some, you know, really high temperatures, if not record heat. And that's, uh, slows things down as far as weight gain goes. And so I, I, I still think there's some reasons to be friendly to the cattle market, especially, um, I think this is just me talking uh, i don't have a lot of data to back this up I think on the pork side um there's sti- the, the pain is there i mean we've been too low too long right some of the smaller producers um are, are, they are going to quit i'm not saying they're going broke but some of those that are the you know kind of still the farmer feeder type people they're not going to give back uh they're not going to lose farm ground because of hogs and so some of this has been a capacity issue i think we would have seen more liquidation uh, but we didn't have the capacity and so i think that's going to happen as you go forward the next um you know quarter or even two quarters and so longer term that's what the hog markets needed for a long time we've had too much supply and that's what you need to do when you have too much supply is you need to pull back, um, you know, pull that back and have the supply meet the demand and, and prices rise. And I think you're going to see that it's just going to take a little while in the hog. So from the protein side, I, I think we're in an okay standpoint, but, uh, you know, I'll qualify that with this whole COVID deal. Nobody knows what the next week is, let alone the next uh, six months on this COVID thing. You know, we, yeah. we we went through our challenges with packing plants. Brazil's seeing that right now. They've got, uh, you know, packing plants shut and grain terminals shut. And, um, we, you know, if that flares back up, that, that risk is always there. But I, I think that the uh, hog and cattle market are for where we're at right now. Um, we, we got through, you know... The, we got through the hurricane right now. Now, right. Is there, are we going to get our head knocked off by a tornado after the hurricane? I'm not sure, but we're at least through the hurricane right now. Right. Yeah, I'm just looking at slaughter numbers right here. And, I mean, they are showing June beef production was 7% above last year. So there there is a, some positive signs there about getting, the, you know, the, everything back open and, and rolling again. And everything on these graphs that I'm looking at are, are pointing towards that, that – uh, that slaughter rate getting back up there on hogs and, and beef both. Yeah, those numbers have really bounced back, you know, from the lows back uh, during the COVID shutdown. So uh, it just shows you, you know, what just ag in general is so resilient. Um, that, that's the bright spot of everything, you know, is like if you just let it work, it will work and and ag whether it's the grain side or the livestock side if you let it work it it'll, it'll it'll work itself out and we'll get things figured out and the problem is when you throw the government in there too much it it just throws a monkey wrench into the gears of the whole mechanism but uh I'd say it's been a pretty exemplary uh few months here through this covid thing from a grain production and and livestock production and the and the packing struggles that we've had and you know it could be a lot worse right now looking back on what we just went through the last uh, two or three months that is a very true statement so all right chip well it's good stuff here we got a lot of information out there today folks are working on their plan or trying to figure out what their next move is based on what they see happen around us What's the best way to get a hold of you and your group? Yeah, best way is just give us a call at the office, 309-550-7213, and uh, we'd love to chat with you and uh, kind of uh, 
help you out with where you're at and what your plan might be and how we might be able to improve that uh, plan and uh, and execute better. Right on. Well, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's where you're going to find all the latest editions of the Moving Iron Podcast as well as movingironllc.com. That's where you'll find the podcast and all the latest news having to do with Moving Iron LLC. Also, check out the Global Ag Network and the great podcasters out there as well. And if you're listening to this and you're following some auction markets, make sure you check out Tractor Zoom. Um, they're a great sponsor of this podcast, but they're also a great place to find good information about what's going on in the auction market. So with that, I am Casey Seymour with Chip Nellinger. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard.